<laughs> Welcome back. So uh, <clears throat> today I'll try to do some uh, experiment. So half, half blackboard, half slides, some uh, presentation to make it a bit more uh, lively, I hope. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so this morning we, uh, we gave some uh, general um, background on uh, extreme value statistics and, uh, and large deviations. And now we are trying to, to capitalize on, on, on this uh, to discuss the properties of the largest uh, eigenvalue of uh, matrices, in particular, shut up, and I mean it. Good. So the largest eigenvalue of Gaussian um, matrices, OK? So what do you know about Gaussian matrices? Sorry? Yes, characterized by a certain index, which is called beta, right? Beta equals to 1, 2, or 4. What we know about the density of eigenvalues they follow? Exactly. So Gaussian random matrices, the average density of eigenvalues in the large end limit follow this semicircular law. Do you remember the? edge points of the semicircle, how do they scale? So root 2, n, and then you have something else? You have a beta in here, right? So the edges of the semicircle will scale as root 2, beta, n. Which means that if you rescale all the eigenvalues by root beta n, okay, so you produce your, your random matrices, you collect the eigenvalues, and then you, you divide each eigenvalue by square root of beta n. In this, in this case, the semicircle will run between minus root 2 and root 2. Do we agree on that? So the semicircle will not scale with, with n. If you take n equal to 50 or n equal to 100, after this rescaling, all the eigenvalues, all the histograms will collapse on this same universal curve. Good. So now, if I ask you the question, what will be the typical value of the largest eigenvalue? for a Gaussian matrix once we have done this rescaling. So typically, what, where do you expect the largest eigenvalue to sit? Root 2. Why? Yeah, so this is the, this is the edge of the semicircle. So it is, in some sense, uh, to be expected that the largest eigenvalue will be situated around this, this position, right? Actually, we can, we can prove this, but we will just assume that this is true. So the average of the largest eigenvalue of Gaussian matrices, once this rescaling has taken place, will be at root 2. Now, what about fluctuations around these this values? So for example, what about the standard deviation or, yeah? No, no. What I what I what I mean with this is that you can compute the average value of the largest eigenvalue for finite n. So for a matrix that is of size three by three, five by five, fifty by fifty, and then you take the limit n to infinity. So for any finite n, you have a non-zero probability of having your largest eigenvalue 
bigger than root 2. That's for sure. But in the limit n to infinity, this is, this is the correct statement, if you want. OK? Good. So what about the fluctuations of the largest eigenvalue? For example, what is the full distribution of the largest eigenvalue? Well, this problem was uh, a very uh, important and difficult one for a, long, for a long time. Now I give you one result, and then we will try to um, understand why this result is so, is so important. So this, uh, this result is due, well, the official date is 1994, although in 1992 we already knew quite a good, a good deal of information about this, this problem. So if we write lambda max equal to root 2, which is its average value, plus a correction, which is of order n to the minus two third, the same the same two third that we have seen in the in the context of May's model, chi of beta. So this is a random variable. We write this random variable as its its average or more or typical value plus a fluctuation times another random variable. chi of beta, where beta can be 1, 2, or 4. Then the result of 1994 is that in the limit n to infinity, the limit n to infinity of the probability that chi beta is smaller or equal than s, so this is the cumulative distribution of this random variable, this scaled random variable, in the limit n to infinity, this, this limit exists once the scaling has been performed, and it is equal to f1 of s, or f2 of s, or f4 of s, where these functions are non-trivial non -trivial functions. Oh, thank you. OK? So, so the, uh, now I will give you the expressions of, of these, these fun functions. These functions are called Tracy Widom distributions. Because we have three, three types of, of functions depending on beta. Okay, so this, this result was proven by these two gentlemen here, you can see, Craig Tracy and, and Harold Widom between 92 and, and 94, so the, the most complete version of their work appeared in 1994. Okay, so they, they managed to compute the limiting distribution of the largest eigenvalue of Gaussian matrices in this scaling, scaling limit. Just to make contact with the case of IID random variable, here root 2 and n to the minus 2 third over root 2 are the analog of the scaling constant an and bn in the case of the IID random variables. Okay? So you take, you take your random variable, you, you bring it to the mean value, you scale it by the, by the scale of typical fluctuation, and what remains in the limit n to infinity has a non-trivial distribution which is n independent. This non-trivial distribution is given by these functions. The only problem here is that these functions are much more complicated even to write down and even to plot than the corresponding extreme value di distributions for IAD random variable. Okay, so if you compare the complexity of these objects with the Gamble, Frechet, or Weibull, these are incredibly more difficult. I will give you one uh, example. Take, for example, F2 of S. So the tracy widom distribution for the Gaussian unitary ensemble, beta equals to 2. So this is 
has this expression. It is an exponential of a function which is constructed this way. It's minus the integral between s to infinity of x minus s q squared of x dx where q of x satisfies a certain differential equation. So it satisfies the differential equation q2 second derivative of x is equal to 2 q cubed x plus x q of x with some appropriate boundary conditions. So you see, this, this type of object is, is very complicated even to write down and even to plot. Suppose that you want to plot this, this distribution, what you have to do? You have to solve a certain differential equation and pick up a, a particular solution of this differential equation satisfying some specific boundary condition. And then you need to plug the solution of this differential equation inside an integral, perform the integral, and then take the exponential. So once you have done this, you can plot your, your function. Now, in, uh, in, the, in the handout, I just reproduced some, some code that was available in, uh, in, in some paper to actually perform this, this operation numerically. So you, in order to plot it, you need to do all this, these operations. And on page 25, you get basically the result of this, of this small code. This is, not, this is not F2 of S, but it's the derivative. So it is, it is the corresponding PDF. Clearly, this one is a, is a cumulative distribution. You can differentiate this, and you will get these three curves here on page 25. Okay. Good. And <clears throat> so this equation here has a name. It is a it is a nonlinear second order differential differential equation which goes under the name of Penleve two equation. I will not get too much into the details of, of this. Here we have a specific solution satisfying certain boundary conditions of a Penleve two equation. So this this result was really a tour de force in mathematical physics. The, uh, the proof of this result spans several, several pages. It is not, uh, not, tri not a trivial, um, trivial result at, at all. Now, um, if you want, we can show something uh, here. So here is the, what, what I told you. There are also the other, the other functions, f1 and, f and f4. I will make this presentation available for, for you so you can you can have all the, all the information. And here you have basically upstairs, we have F1, F2, and F4 in, in, in this form. So th these are uh, cumulative distributions. They, they start from zero and they saturate at, at one, even, even if this is absolutely not obvious from, from the expression, that this, this guy goes to one on, on the right and goes to zero on, on the left, but, but it so happens. And this is the derivative of of the three, so the, the corresponding PDF. And actually, this is probably not interesting, but we can show, so uh, in, uh, in a paper, uh, in a numerical paper that I have probably linked in the, in the handout, if not, I can, I can just give you exactly the, the reference, they actually put this, this result to the test so they, they wrote a very efficient routine to compute the largest eigenvalue histogram, the histogram of the largest eigenvalue of Gaussian, Gaussian matrices. You compute the largest eigenvalue, you perform this operation, so you scale out root two and you, and you divide by this, by this number, and then you, you plot a normalized histogram of the, of the results, and actually you can see 
that the normalized and scaled eigenvalue for beta equals 1, 2, and 4 precisely match the solid line, which is the Tracy Whedon PDF. Okay? So th this, this result is true, and you can test it uh, numerically, even yourself, even this, this afternoon, by just using MATLAB. So this is done in, in, in MATLAB. As you can see, these PDFs are, are interesting because they, they don't look like Gaussians uh, at all. They have very highly as asymmetric uh, tails, and they have this, this very, very funny and weird, weird shape described by, by this extremely complicated expression. That's, that's, that's life. Okay, so why, uh, well, okay, Th this result was very important in the random matrix uh, community, but, but actually over, over time we started realizing that this result is, is really much deeper than, than it seems, because this, these tracy Weedham distributions keep appearing in so many completely unrelated uh, problems. So although they were originally discovered in, in random matrix uh, theory, they, uh, they are appearing in several, several problems, including combinatorial problems, problems with like stochastic growth uh, evolutions, problem in me mesoscopic physics. There are you know, several uh, instances of, of problems that are completely unrelated where this, these complicated objects which cannot appear by chance, actually crop up naturally. So the, the one, what, I, what I wanted to do now is to describe one such, such problem in, in combinatorics where the tracy widom distribution appears and where you will see that there is absolutely no link whatsoever with, with random matrix, matrix theory. Okay? So the, the problem, uh, the combinatorial problem that I wanted to discuss is basically uh, was solved uh, after uh, many, many years by these people uh, in 1999 uh, on the distribution of the length of the longest increasing subsequence of random, random permutations. So the title seems obs obscure, but actually the problem is very simple. It's, it's a very simple combinatorial uh, problem. So I will, I will try to explain you what, uh, what this is. So you have a sequence of integers Okay. In this case, seven integers, and you have a preferred direction from, from left to right. So you should read this sequence from left to right, as you would do normally. Five, two, eight, three, four, ten, nine. Then out of this uh, sequence of, of integer, you can isolate n increasing subsequence. So an increasing subsequence is a subsequence from left to right, which increases. So for example, 3, 4, 9 is an increasing subsequence. 3, 4, 10 is an increasing subsequence. 2, 8 is an increasing subsequence. OK? This is a super simple definition. What you can do is then you can isolate the longest increasing subsequence. So for example, here you have 2, 3, 4, 9 is the longest increasing subsequence. It has length four, and you cannot find an increasing subsequence of length five or higher. It is possible that you find two longest increasing subsequences. This is possible, or three or more, but the size of the longest increasing subsequence is clearly fixed because it is the longest. In this case, the size of the longest increasing subsequence is four. Good, so what, uh, if I give you a, a sequence of, of integers, there is uh, an algorithm which is called the patient sorting uh, algorithm, which is inspired by the solitaire uh, card game, where you can, in the most efficient way, find out what the longest increasing subsequence is. Okay? So the algorithm. Uh, is described as follows. You take your sequence above, and you start from the left. So you take this card, 5, and you put it here. You put it down. Then you consider the second one, which is 2, card 2. The card 2 is, has a smaller value than 5, 
so you can put it on top of the previous pile. So you get 5, 2. Now you get 8. 8 is larger than 2, right? So you need to form another, another pile next to it. And when you form another pile next to it, you draw a pointer, an arrow, from this pile to the top card of the previous pile. Does it make sense? So 5, 2, because 2 is smaller, so you put it on top, but the 8 is larger, so you need to form another pile. So now you've got 3, where, where would you put 3? You will put 3 on top of 8, right? And then, but, and you need to, to remember that you need to put an arrow pointing from this top card to the top card of the previous pile. Why? Sorry? Why well, that's, that's how the algorithm, that's, what, that's how the algorithm works. You will see at the end when I, when I do everything. So four, you do four. So four, you need, you need to put another, another pile. So you can observe that at any stage of the algorithm, top cards of piles increase from left to right. Two, three, four. This is obvious, right? And then you do 10, and you put a pointer to the top card of the previous pile. And then nine, and you put a pointer. Now, look how many piles you have formed. Four, and four is the, is the length of the longest increasing subsequence. Not only that, but you can reconstruct which, which one is the increasing subsequence by reading, you know, by following these, these arrows. For example, two, three, four, nine. You see? Okay. So this, uh, this algorithm gives you automatically the length of the longest increasing sub subsequence and one sample, one example of the actual increasing, longest increasing subsequence. Give an example, not all the sequences. No. Not all the sequences, okay? But it, it, given the simplicity of the algorithm, we, we shouldn't complain, probably. We can be, we can be happy. Okay, is the, is the problem clear? Good, now, what, what, uh, here we don't have any, any randomness, except from, for the fact that, well, the original sequence is not a specific sequence, I just, uh, you know, I just made it up. So how can we make this, this problem more um, quantitative and introduce uh, randomness? Well, what you can do is you take the ordered sequence of the first n integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then what you can do is you can consider all the permutations of, of the, the string of the sequence of the first n integers. For example, this is one permutation, 5, 7, 4, 1, 6, 3, 2, this is another permutation, 4, 6, 5, 1, 3, 2, 7. Okay. And you consider all the n factorial permutation that you can, that you can uh, describe. And now imagine that all the permutations have equal probability. So, they, so, they can, so you have an ensemble of permutations which can occur with equal probability. And for each of these permutations, you compute the length of the longest increasing subsequence. So you do the patient sorting algorithm on this one, on this one, and on all the n factorial permutations that you have. So basically you get one number, the length of the longest increasing subsequence per permutation. You get n factorial numbers out, out of this algorithm, right? And now you can ask, what is the distribution of, of these numbers? For example, here, I don't know, maybe the length of the longest increasing subsequence will be 2. Maybe here it will be 7. Another one will be uh, 3. So how are these numbers distributed? How often do you get a longest increasing subsequence that is equal to 1, to 2, to 3, up to n? Right? If, if you put a uniform distribution on the permutation, this is a probabilistic uh, question that you might, that you might ask. So how, how frequent is it that you get um, a certain length of between 1 and, and n? Well, 
clearly here we don't we do have randomness we don't have any uh, reference to random random matrices here for example i i put i highlighted the the longest decreasing subsequences so for, for example in this case we have 5 7 that's it so the length here is 2 here we have uh, the longest increasing subsequences length 3 4 5 7 okay so we have 2 3 another one what we left 5 1 7 how how are these numbers distributed if all the permutations are equally likely well here in this table for n the length of the sequence equal to 15, I list the number. So here on this column, you have the number of sequences whose longest increasing subsequence is equal to 1, is equal to 2, is equal to 3, is equal to 15. OK? So what is, what is the sum of all these numbers on, on, in this column? Yeah, so the sum of all, of all these numbers is, is 15 factorial, okay? Here we have one, one permutation which has longest increasing subsequence equal to 1. Which permutation is this? Yeah, the one which is reversed. So you have 15, 14, 13, and then the length of the longest increasing subsequence is 1. The same thing here. We have only one... Uh, permutation where the longest increasing subsequence has length 15, which is the identical permutation, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 15, then the length is 15. But these, these other numbers are, are non-trivial. For example, we have 196 um, permutations where the length of the longest increasing subsequence is, is 14. It means basically that you have swapped two numbers. Sorry? Yeah, exactly. For, for the others, it becomes a, a bit more um, intricate, right? But, but look at this. You know, if, if, if you divide these numbers by 15 factorial, then you get the probability of basically having, for example, uh, a certain sub long length of the longest increases subsequence equal to 7 or 8, right? All you have to do is to divide the number by 15 factorial. Now, you, you see this, this shape here? Does it remind you of anything? You see? You see this, the, the shape of, of the numbers? Yes. Hmm? It's like a sail. Well. So this, this problem, so the characterizing the distribution of, of, of this uh, number has, has a long, uh, has a long uh, history. So the expected, um, the expected length uh, for, for a subsequence of, uh, for, for a sequence of, of size n divided by, by root n, so it is expected that the expectation would grow with, with, the, square root, with the square root of n. So this was conjectured by Ulam in 1961, and then there were since then a lot of a lot of different results. Yeah. But the characterization of the full distribution was not uh, was not known until the, the work I showed you in 1999. Um, uh, there were a lot of numerical simulations by Ozlisko and and Reins from 1993, but then the the final result came out. This is a theorem. It's a very complicated uh, paper, but the final, the final theorem in this, uh, in this paper is as follows. If you take the length, the length of the longest increasing subsequence for a sequence of size n, which is a random, random variable, you take out 2 square root n, and then you divide by n to the power 1 sixth. This new random variable, chi, chi n, has a probability the cumulative distribution function, which in the limit n to infinity, converges to the F2 of x. So to the tracy widom distribution corresponding to the GUE. So, so we have a completely unexpected link between 
uh, a result that first appeared in random matrix theory. And, and look, this, I mean, the history could have been easily reversed. We could have, we could have discovered this result first. And, and, the, and the distribution of the largest eigenvalue later. And then we would, have, we would have said, well, it would have had another name. It would have been the bike, dived, and Johansson distribution. Too bad for, for Trace and William. Okay? They could have discovered it first, and then we would have discovered later that the, that the same function rules the distribution of the largest eigenvalue of Gaussian random matrices. A connection that is completely non non obvious because there is there is no random matrices in in there and yet there these two objects are described by the same the same distribution okay here if you're not if you're not convinced here are numerical simulations meaning well you can produce uh, large uh, sequences of, of numbers uh, you can produce permutations of, of these numbers and do exactly the same, the same operation. You take the length of, of, uh, of uh, each um, permutation and then you scale to root n, you divide by n to the power one sixth and then you, you perform, you compute the histogram of, of it and then you see that the points fall nicely on top of the tracy widom curve as the, the top eigenvalue of the GUE would but these, these are taken from, from the, the problem of permutations and longest increasing subsequence with, with uniform um, probability. Okay. Yes, so this, uh, okay. You can just read the quote by Shakespeare. I like it. Okay, so this is not this is not the only example where Tracy Widom distribution has appeared completely, you know, uh, in in a completely unexpected um, unexpected way. Um, I will not prove any of of these results. The the proof is just too complicated, and it's, it's not even particularly um, illuminating or or anything. It's it's very technical. Um, <clears throat> what I will do is to introduce now another uh, technique which is very, very useful in random matrix theory to uh, discuss the problem of large deviations for uh, the largest eigenvalue of Gaussian, Gaussian matrices. Now, let me describe a bit some, let me give you some, some background. So, large deviations of the largest Okay, question What is the joint probability density of the eigenvalues of Gaussian matrices. Can you help me? So Gaussian matrices, GOE, GUE, or GSE. What is the joint PDF of the eigenvalues? We've seen it over and over again, right? Can someone help me? Coffee? We'll ask you one by one. Remember, we have a Gaussian, a Gaussian bit as if the eigenvalues were independent Gaussian variable, but then we have another geometric factor which correlates them all, right? So, apart from, from a normalization constant, let's call it B, Bn beta, well, I some, sometimes call it zeta, we have exponential of minus one half summation, right? And then we have, sorry? <laughs> okay. 
You remember? Okay, so you have, you have the Gaussian weight, which is a model, model specific. It will be something different for, for, for another random matrix model. But then you have a geometric factor, which is the Jacobian of the change of variables between uh, entries and eigenvalues and, and eigenvector, which is this van der Mond determinant raised to the power, raised to the power beta. Okay? Now remember that we, we decided to rescale from the beginning the eigenvalues by root beta n. To, to, if we do that, we get a semicircle that, whose edges don't grow with, with n. So it is, it is convenient to do this, this rescaling. So in the end, we will have a semicircle between minus root 2 and, and root 2. Okay? So if we do this at the level of the joint distribution, so we would have like lambda i tilde, if you want. Well, the only, the only change here is that you will get a factor beta n in front. So if you, if you just make this, this correction to the joint PDF, you are describing the same Gaussian ensemble just with the semicircle between minus root 2 and, and root 2. Okay? Just try to convince yourself. The only thing to do, the only thing I'm doing is I'm taking out a factor root beta n from each eigenvalue. Okay? Good. But then we can rewrite this, this object in the, in the form exponential of minus beta n alpha summation i 1 to n lambda i square minus 1 alpha summation, I don't know, i different from j, log lambda i minus lambda j. So I put this, this term here, as I do always, in the exponential. Is it clear why I put this factor one half in, in front here? Sorry? We have an of the so, so here we have a product uh, for j smaller than, than k. And here I'm taking the summation over all pairs, i different from j. And so I'm, I'm, count, I'm double counting uh, pairs. So lambda 1 minus lambda 2 and lambda 2 minus lambda 1 would, should, should, should be basically, this double counting should be discounted by taking the factor of 1 alpha. Okay? Good. You remember why I was doing this, this operation earlier, like yesterday or two days ago? You remember I did this already? Yes? No? <laughs> because this, this guy here is, has this very interesting form exponential of minus beta into a certain function h of the eigenvalues, right? And, and this, this form reminds us of what? Exactly. Good. So we can interpret the guess of eigenvalues as a proper thermodynamical system in canonical equilibrium at inverse temperature beta. Good. So now, if we want to, to compute the distribution of the largest eigenvalue, so now I need your, your help. So, I give you the joint PDF of the eigenvalues for a random matrix model, P of lambda 1, lambda n, in this form. And what I want to compute is the probability that lambda max is smaller or equal than x. So this is the, this is the task. This function encodes all the properties about the eigenvalues. So in some sense, this object must be computed starting, or must be computable starting from this one. The question is, how can we set up a calculation for this object? What, what can we do on this function to obtain this object? 
Anyone wants to try? Yeah, so you need to integrate. You need to integrate. Like this? Yes. Like this? Yes. Like this? Yes? Okay. Who is uh, in agreement? Everybody agrees? No. So whoever disagrees needs to tell me the right way to proceed. So you say, instead of from x to infinity, we have another option, from 0 to x. OK. So probably, it should be from minus infinity, because the eigenvalues can also be negative. So, so we want all the eigenvalues to be between minus infinity and x. Right? Correct? Because if all the eigenvalues are between minus infinity and x, then the largest eigenvalue is smaller than x. You hoo <laughs> Agree? Why is it so? Okay. Good. So now I want to uh, ask you some, some more uh, questions. Here we have the joint PDF of the eigenvalues, which we have written in this Gibbs Boltzmann form. Okay? Exponential of minus beta h. And now we are integrating the position of our particles which are described by this exponential minus beta h, over a certain region of space between minus infinity and, and x. So in StatMac, what is this object? How would you call this object? We are integrating the Gibbs-Boltzmann uh, measure over the position of the particles up to a certain value x. Some sort of weird partition function. Excellent. Yes. This is exactly a partition function, right? Because we are integrating over the position of the particle, but we are restricting the integration over a certain region of space. Okay? So we can call this object Zn of x, where this is the partition function of a gas of charged particles subject to a two-dimensional Coulomb potential, restricted to a line, and such that no particle exceeds x. Okay. So this, this is, uh, is now a completely classical, albeit a bit complicated, um, problems in, in classical, classical physics. You have, a, you have a gas of particles where you put an extra constraint that they cannot lie to the right of a barrier at, at x. And then if you release the barrier, so if you send x to infinity, you would, you would recover the standard partition function, the standard canonical partition function, where you let your particles occupy the full, uh, the full real axis. You see? So you have a problem of uh, thermodynamics of a, of a constrained gas, where you, put, where you put a barrier at a certain position, and you start squeezing your gas. So x is here. If you push this barrier here, then your gas will be forced to accumulate here, right? Because normally at equilibrium, they would, they would occupy a certain semicircular distribution. But you are pushing this gas to be within a much narrower region than, they would, than it would normally occupy at equilibrium. OK? 
So now statistic stat mac tells us what, what we should do, right? What we should do to understand what is the equilibrium configuration of this gas. What is the most likely configuration of, of the particles? Sorry? Go ahead. Sorry? You. You. Okay. Minimize the free energy. Good. So we have this, this gas of, of particles, and we want to know what is the most likely configuration of eigenvalues of particles, given that they need to, be, to lie to the left of this, of this barrier. So we will need to find the configuration of eigenvalues of particles, which minimize the free energy, which is the logarithm of this, of this object. Okay. Do, we all, do we all agree? Okay. So you see that we have, we have turned our uh, probabilistic problem, so to find the probability of the largest eigenvalue, into a problem of statistical mechanics with, with long-range interaction and in the presence of, of a barrier, in the presence of a wall, of an impenetrable wall at the position x. So all we have to do is to try to solve this, this problem. Good. So we can make now a break, and then I will try to, to sketch how we can try to approach this problem. Okay, <clears throat> just, to, uh, just to clarify what, uh, what I'm uh, doing, uh, I got a couple of questions. So here we have our semicircle with an edge at root 2. So the largest eigenvalue will have an average around root 2 and will fluctuate in the larger limit according to a tracy widom distribution. Here, over a typical scale of n to the minus two third. Okay, this is the the analog of the uh, central central limit theorem. So a Gaussian with a typical scale, which is of the order of the of the standard deviation that we have seen uh, yesterday. Now, uh, in order to obtain this scaling uh, function, so the trace widom, well, you have to to do a lot of uh, a lot of work. What I was suggesting now is to devise a way to treat this this problem using a statmec analogy and this stat statmec analogy goes under the name of not surprisingly Coulomb gas method. Okay, so this is one of the uh, standard tricks in uh, in random matrix, matrix theory. So you you are mapping your problem, your statistical problems on eigenvalues onto the partition function of a system of charged particle with some with some uh, weird constraints. In this case, the fact that you have an impenetrable wall at a location x. This, uh, this mapping and this method is, is very efficient. It has, uh, it has a drawback, though. So it is not, is it not nearly as precise as you would like to to, to basically uh, nail down this, this distribution over a scale of n to the minus, minus two-thirds. So this, this method is not powerful enough. What you can gain from, from this method, and I will try to, to do this calculation between today and maybe um, tomorrow, what you can, you can get here are basically the large deviation tails to the left and 
to the right of this of this distribution. For example, using this using this method, you can answer the question: What is the probability that all the eigenvalues of a Gaussian matrix are negative? This is clearly a very unlikely event, which becomes exponentially less likely when you increase the, the size of your, of your matrix. And this, this type of, of question, basically, uh, for this type of questions, you are probing this region of the distribution. And, and, and here, you have, you have access to those using the Coulomb gas, gas method. So, so it's it's a trade-off. If you want a more, uh, you know, a more specific and m more precise information of what happens around the mean, you need to, you know, invest a lot of time learning the tricks that led Trace and Weedham to um, to find their their function. If you are happy with some information about the large deviation tails, then you can use a faster but less precise method which is called the Coulomb gas method. This is the one that I was describing, that I was started to describe now. OK? Is this sort of, sort of clear? The starting point is always the same. Probability that lambda max is more or equal than x. But the methods to investigate the large and limits are different, are much, le much less sophisticated in this, in this case. Good. So Coulomb gas method, it, you will need to learn it because it's, it's very interesting. It is, it is related to the physics of, of the eigenvalues as a gas of, of charged particles. So the goal, what we have to compute, is to estimate what happens for large n to this constrained partition function. I call it now. Uh, w instead of x, it is the same object as before. So exponential, I just rewrite it slightly, but is the same object I had before, 1 over 2n summation i1 to n lambda i square minus 1 over 2n square summation i different from j log of lambda i minus lambda j. So the only thing uh, I did is I put uh, an n square factor in evidence here and divided by n and n square here, and just renamed x by omega just because, uh, just by uh, w, because this is the way I, I wrote the notes. Otherwise, it would be, you know, a mess going from one convention to another. It's the same. It's the same thing. So. What we want to estimate, this will be the, our partition function. We want to know how the free energy of this constrained gas will behave in the limit n to infinity. Okay? In order to do that, we, we, we need to estimate the exponential growth of the partition function in, in, a, in a rather precise, precise way. Okay? So what happened to this object or to the logarithm of this object as n to infinity, this is our goal. OK, so the Coulomb gas method proceeds uh, through a series of dirty steps that mathematicians don't like. That's why I'm doing that. OK, so the first dirty step to carve out the large n behavior of this object is uh, introduce a counting, counting function. So let me explain what do I mean by that. I will just proceed formally, and then let's, let's try to see what, what this object means. Let's call it n of x, 1 over n, c 
summation I want to n delta of x minus lambda i. So the counting function is basically the, at, at this level, is the non-average version of the spectral density. OK? So it is this, the sum of spikes at the location of each, of each eigenvalues. OK. Sorry? Well, yes, yes. But apart from, yeah, apart from a, trivial, a trivial risk, well, well, even for fractions, you need to count, right? Do, we, do you agree? Kind of. Kind of. Okay. Are you a mathematician? Okay, excellent. I, 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 did, I, didn't, I didn't expect to, to be stopped at this, at this early stage. <laughs> Good. Okay. Now, why is this object uh, useful? Well, because of a couple of dirty tricks. Which corresponds to our second step of, of the process. Okay? So instead of so instead of summing or integrating over lambda 1, lambda n, which is the operation we need to perform, we do something else. Okay? We call lambda 1, lambda n microstates just to make contacts with the language we use in StatMac. Okay? A microstate is a configuration of particles arranged in a given, in a given order on the real line. These are microstates of our fluids. So instead of summing or integrating over lambda 1, lambda n, which is the, the, the thing that we should do, we do something else. So we first fix a certain profile, a certain function n of x. Forget the definition. Fix a certain function n of x. And then this n of x will be non negative, smooth, and normalized. And then we sum. Over all microstates which are compatible with the n of x that we fixed. So this is a long. Uh, a long series of, of words. Actually, the concept is, is quite simple. We have here a certain microstate, but we might have other microstates, so other arrangement of our particles, that if viewed from a macroscopic point of view, would give rise to the same density profile. So this is the same thing that we do when we study gases in uh, standard statistical mechanics. We, we might have different arrangements of the particles in your gas that, gives rise, that give rise to the same macroscopic properties, to the same volume, pressure, you know? So all we, have, all we, we are trying to say here is that instead of summing over the microstates, so over all the, the microscop microscopic configurations of the eigenvalues, we first fix a certain macroscopic density profile, okay? and then we integrate over all the microstates that would contribute to the same macrostate. Okay? 
So it is just another way to perform the same, the same summation, but introducing a smooth density function, which is what we call the counting function there. So it is the, ex the exact translation of what we always do in classical statistical mechanics, except in a, in a slightly different setting. Okay. Good. In, in practice, how this, uh, this operation is, is carried out? Well, introducing another of the dirty tricks which is a quite fancy representation of one in terms of a functional integral. Have you ever seen anything like that? You have, but maybe not, not explicitly. But you have. Okay? So here we are saying that we, if, we are, if we integrate over all possible non-negative smooth and normalized function n of x, such that this n of x is exactly equivalent to its its definition, then the integral over all the whole space of functions defined in this in this way should give should reproduce one, okay? Because this this integral will just single out one of of the functions, the the only one that corresponds to its definition. Okay, so this is the functional uh, version of the standard identity for for delta standard delta function, right? Is that clear? Good. Okay. So now we have a very interesting representation of one that we insert into the integral we had before. So what we obtain is that by exchanging the order of integration, we can rewrite our partition function as a functional integral over smooth functions n of x of what? Of the integral between minus infinity and w of d lambda 1, d lambda n of the exponential of everything else times this delta So, for, for a given uh, profile, for a given density profile n of x, I'm basically integrating over all microstates that are compatible with this density profile, because this density profile must be equal to this object. Okay? And then I'm integrating over all possible smooth, non-negative, and normalized functions. So I'm doing this, the initial integrations just in two steps. I'm first grouping all the microstates according to a given macrostates, and then I'm summing over all possible macrostates. But why is this trick uh, useful? Because, be because now we can, we can use the property of, of this delta function to simplify this multiple integration. We'll show you how to, to do that. The fact that we have introduced this counting function allows us to use the identities so summation i1 to n of f any function of lambda i this can be written as n integral dx 
f of x n of x. So all you have to do is to replace here the definition of n of the counting function in terms of the delta, the sum over delta function of x minus lambda i, and carry out the integration. Is that clear? Yeah? 1 over n, this 1 over n will cancel this n. Then you pull this summation out, and then this delta function will, will, will kill the integral, replacing at every occurrence of x with lambda i. OK? So now we can convert sums with integrals into integrals, and double sums into, well, guess what? double integrals, right? So, so why are these identities important? Because in the, our Hamiltonian for our particles contain exactly single sum and double sums. For example, in the Hamiltonian, you find a term of this form. Right? So this, this term will, will be equal to what? Just use the first, the first formula. So this will become n integral over the x, n of x, x squared. Right? And in the Hamiltonian, we had the 1 over 2n in front. So this object is 1 over 2n times n. Then for the logarithmic interaction term, we have to do a bit more work. Because you remember, in the Hamiltonian, we have a logarithmic interaction term of this form, summation i different from j, log of lambda i minus lambda j. Right? This is the term that we had in the, in the Hamiltonian, which is not exactly of this form, because the term i equal to j is excluded by this, by this sum. Uh, the reason is that if, la if i becomes equal to, to j, this contribution becomes infinite. Okay? And this infinite contribution has a very physical uh, reason, because if, this means that if, if two charged particles are made to coincide, then basically this is, this, the, this is the contribution to the self-energy of, of an electron. Okay? So we need to find a way to take this uh, infinite contribution to the, to the energy away from, from the sum, so to, to renormalize it. The, the way to do it is to write, rewrite this sum formally, including the term ij, and then subtracting the term i equal to j. Okay. So formally, we can write this as 1 over 2n squared summation over i and j all logarithm of lambda i minus lambda j, but then subtracting the term that we can write as delta of lambda i. So this is basically a, a short distance cutoff between the two electrons, which renormalizes the self-energy interaction when i is equal to j. The precise way this, this object is, is defined is, well, this would be in principle a problem, but it turns out to be irrelevant for the, for the calculation. Okay? So this, this correction term will be subleading anyway. 
So although its precise, precise form it would be important in general, it turns out that for this specific calculation it is not, which is a good thing. So we can, we, we, we can forget it for, for the moment. So this object here will then become equal using the second property here to 1 over 2 n square times n square dx dx prime nx nx prime times log of x minus x prime. Minus a correction term that we can neglect. So I'm just considering this, this first bit here. And I'm just using the second property. Is that clear? OK, excellent. So all we have to do is to take this expression and this expression, and you plug them inside the Hamiltonian here. So we are replacing sums with integrals, which is a very, very good thing, because then, you know, like a, a continuous action will be easier to deal with than a discrete action. So we are replacing sums with, with integrals, and uh, we will have to, to deal only marginally with uh, a complicated integral that we can, we can anyway solve, okay? So, can I raise here? No? Yeah, no? Okay. So let me summarize the, once we have done this, these tricks, So this object, we can leave it. Is uh, everything all right? There's a huge, I sparked a huge debate. Is everything all right? No. Like? Okay, let me write the, the summary and maybe it will, become, it will become clear. So, our restricted or constrained partition function will be equal to what? Well, we had the functional integral over counting functions. And then what we, what we have? We have this the exponential of the Hamiltonian, which is now no longer a function of lambda 1, lambda n, it will be a function, it will be a functional of the counting, the counting function. So we can bring this object outside the integral over lambda 1, lambda n, right? And write it here. So this will become exponential of the quadratic part, which is minus beta n square times 1 half integral dx x square and then we have the interaction part agree so this this is just the the Hamiltonian rewritten in terms of the continuous variables. The quadratic part and the interaction, the interaction part. And now what is, what is left? Yeah, what is left is this delta function, because we need to make sure that the profile we are integrating over are compatible with the, with the, with the microstates. So we need this part and this part is still to be computed. 
So this is multiplied by integral d lambda 1, d lambda n, delta of Right? Now let's let's test a bit of physical intuition. What is this object here? So we we are giving a mathematical um, expression to a very important physical object, right? We, what, what are we doing here? So we are, we, here what we are doing is that we are counting how many microstates are compatible with a given macrostate, which is the definition of of an entropy, right? So the, the logarithm of this object will be would be the entropy of your configuration of eigenvalues, right? So we are giving a mathematical representation of the entropy of our gas. Yeah. We are integrating over all possible configuration of microstates which are compatible with a given macrostate. Make sense? Good. So the, ol the only thing we, we would have to do is to perform this, this integration. This can be done, at least in the, in the large end limit. Um, I will give this as an exercise with a pointer to the, to the place where you can find the solution. But there is a good, uh, a good uh, news, is that this object, let's call it I n of n x and w, scales for large n as exponential minus n integral dx n x log n x. So you see, for, for large n, we have here an expression that looks really like an entropy. So we have n x log n x integrated. But the important thing is that it scales as expo exponential of minus n here. Instead, this term of the action scales as exponential of minus n square. So, so the good thing in, in this type of calculations is that this gas of particle is energetically dominated. So it is the free energy is dominated by the energetic component, <coughs> while the entropic component of the free energy is subdominant, is subleading. Can you, can you give a physical intuition why this gas is dominate, the free energy of this gas is dominated by the energetic component and not the entropic component? Yeah, so this is a system that is long-range correlated. So we have interaction, which is a pair, pairwise, but long-range, OK? So, so the, the energetic contribution would scale as n square, because n square is the order of the number of pairs of particles that are interacting. Okay. So we are in a, in a regime that normally we don't consider in standard stat-mech uh, problems, where the energy the internal energy and the entropy are assumed to scale in the same way with n, are assumed to be extensive, typically. Here we have a completely different situation. The entropy, the logarithm of the entropy is, well, the logarithm of the counting function is extensive, so the entropy is extensive, but the energy is super ex extensive. It goes as n square, not n. 
And this is a very, uh, very good thing for, for us, because we can neglect this part. In the larger limit, the entropy will not count. Only this, this part will count. Excellent. So, so now all we have to do is to extract the leading order in N of this, uh, of this action. Sorry? All, all the correction terms are order N or lower. For example, the, uh, the self-energy correction term will be of order N in the exponential. Okay? So, so we, we have a lot of correction terms. And if this object was of order N, we would be in trouble. Because if this was of order N, we would need to keep track of all the correction terms. But the fact that this leading term is n square saves us, because this is the only term of order n square. So it wins in the, in the larger limit. It is leading. OK. So we turned a potential disaster into something that we could actually work with very well. So our constraint partition function is of the type functional integral of exponential of what? Of minus beta n square into some functional of n of x plus corrections. And this functional, this functional here, will cl clearly depend on omega, or w. So what is this functional? This functional is just this, this guy here, right? So it is 1 half integral between minus infinity and omega, dx and x, x squared, minus 1 half integral between minus infinity and omega, dx, dx prime, and x, and x prime, log of x minus x prime. Now, you tell me what, what we do with this. So we have, we have a standard functional integral with an action that scales with, with n squared. So what is the most probable, most probable configuration, n star of x, that gives the, the largest contribution to this, to this integral? Yeah, so how does how is this approximation called? Yeah. Saddle point or Laplace approximation, right? So the largest contribution to this integral comes from the minimizer of of this object here. So what we have to, to compute is the counting function that is such it minimizes the exponent Do we agree? So if we compute this, this object here, this profile n star of x, physically, what, what is this, this object, n star of x, the solution to this minimization problem? So here we have x, our barrier. 
So n star of x, sorry, n star of omega, well, sorry, the barrier was at omega, n star of x is here, okay? So, one, once we have solved this, this problem, physically, this n star of x is what? Yeah? Yes, so this, this n star of x will be the typical density of, of particles in the presence of a barrier at omega, right? Because it will be the counting profile that minimizes the action. Is that sort of clear? So what do we expect it to be? You have, you have a gas of particles that would like to repel each other because they are charged. Okay? They, they are sitting here. Now you arrive here with, with a wall at, at the position omega. At some point, the wall will be far away so your particles will, will not care. They will stay in the same position as if the wall was not there. So what, what would be this, this standard configuration of particles without the wall? The semicircle, right? So if, if W is sent to infinity, we, are, we expect to recover the semicircle. The semicircle is when, where your particles sit comfortably and nobody is disturbing them. But now we have this, this wall here that is approaching. Like, okay? Like shoveling, snow shoveling, you know? That's, you have the semicircle here. And now this wall is at some point touching the edge of the semicircle and starts pressing, starts pushing. So what will happen to the density profile physically? Just, just, just really think about it. You have, you have particles that don't like to stay close to each other, but there is this, this wall which is pushing. So what would they do to minimize their total energy? Any, any idea, any suggestion we can discuss? It's, it's just a very physical, very physical problem, very physical image, right? There, there are several possibilities. For example, the, the gas could, could all move to this, to, to a region far away from, from, the, from the wall. They could decide that the least energetic thing to do is to move along with the, along with the wall. Why this, this is probably not the thing that, that happens? Sorry? Yeah, it is not that probable, but why? Yeah, but, but why, is it, why is it like this? I mean, fine, it, it might be true, but I don't see it. Why, why can't they just move all in this direction? Just a semicircle, but translated. Away from the wall. Sorry? Well, yeah, but, but the semis if without the wall, you have a semicircle, which is, I mean, it, it, they, they arrange into, into a certain shape. Why can't, can't it be a semicircle just a bit far away, further away? I'm just asking uh, about your intuition. I mean, I can give you the solution, but why? Let's, let's discuss about it. We have a, yeah? Yes, exactly. So we see they are sitting in a harmonic, harmonic well, which is centered at, at zero, which means that if we move the semicircle away, the, the gas will increase a lot its, its internal energy, because it will sit on, on not in the minimum of the well anymore. So if we have a quadratic potential well, that's, that's why we have a semicircle here. 
But if we start moving the semicircle here, the internal energy of the gas will increase a lot. Se having a semicircle here is very expensive energetically. Right? So this is, not, this is for sure not, not what, what is going to happen. So the, the configuration that will minimize the energy in the presence of a wall here will be most likely something like this, right? So the density will start to increase a lot around the wall, exactly as, you, as, as snow will, would do if, if you start approaching like a bunch of snow with a, with a shovel, right? So the, the, the gas particles will start to accumulate around the wall because they, they would like to overcome the wall and, and reproduce the semicircle. You are pushing here with a shovel, and the particles will, will try to stay as close as possible to the edge of the semicircle. So it means that they will need to accumulate close to the wall. So the, the density profile that we are expecting to find here will be something that will have a divergence at the location of the wall. That's physically, that's physically obvious, right? Because, because the, 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 the gas of particles would like to stay in their semicircle unperturbed configuration, but they can't because there is a barrier right inside the semicircle. So they cannot be to the right of it. So their, their best preferred solution would be to accumulate here. Agree? Sort of. So now we need to try to find this, that this profile of the density from this calculation. Okay? So let's just write the subtle point equation and then we can finish. So let's perform the functional differentiation of this object with respect to n. Can you help me out with this? So the best configuration of our gas will satisfy a certain equation, which is this one. OK, so if, what happens if we functionally differentiate the first bit? What do we get? Sorry, just pick up loud, loud, loud. I just functionally differentiate this first bit. Of x squared. Then we have a problem. You said this is what you said. This is what you said. Well, this this can't be can't be right, right? Done a functional integral before? Sorry? It's a variance. OK, just give random answers. <laughs> yes, so I want to do this operation. Integral? Yeah. 
So a linearly diverging integral. Yes. So the functional integral, the functional differentiation kills one integral and leaves all the rest. So the result of this object here is one half y squared, or actually x squared. Now, let's do the same thing here. We have So let's let's try to apply the same principle that led here, here. So we know that the functional differentiation will kill one integral, and then it will act on the integrand as a standard derivative. Okay. Now the only problem here is that we have two functions of the same type in the integrand. So the only thing that will happen here is that we get a factor of two. So the solution of this object here will be two times one single integral, because one has been killed by the functional differentiation. And then we will have dy, n of y, and then log of what? x minus y. Right? Because we are taking the functional derivative with respect to x, n of x. So that's. <coughs> That's the result. And now, this object here should be equal to 0. And this will give an equation for our density profile, equilibrium density profile. So what we are going to do tomorrow is we, we are going to rewrite this uh, integral equation for the density profile, and then we will try to solve it. The solution of this, of this integral equation will give us the profile of the equilibrium density in the presence of a wall at the position omega. So we expect that this solution will be the semicircle when omega is larger than root 2. And then something else when omega is smaller than root 2. Okay? And then once we have the equilibrium density of the gas in the presence of the wall, then we are basically done, because this will be the most, most probable configuration. So we can estimate this integral with a subtle point approximation. So in the large end limit, this integral will go as exponential of minus beta n square times e, the, the functional, evaluated at the equilibrium density. And so this object is basically the free energy of the constrained gas. And so our problem is essentially solved. Right? So all you have to do is to try to think physically at what happens if you have a set of charged particles that try to repel each other, but you are, you are sticking a wall right in the middle of where they would like to stay, and you don't let them over, overcome this, this wall. So they need to stay to the left of the walls, but they, they want to be as comfortable as possible given this, the, given this extra constraint. So what, what can they do? They will arrange in a certain different uh, profile, density profile, which will not be the semicircle. And most likely, they will try to be as close as possible to the wall 
Because if the wall was not there, they would immediately be ready to reconstruct the semicircle. They would be immediately be ready to, to swim, to hop over on the other side of, of the fence. Right? Good. Um, yeah, for the, yes. Um, uh, where can I find it? Uh, yeah, I'll find the uh, reference and I'll, uh, I'll, ask, um, I'll ask Erica to, cir to circulate it. Okay. It's, it's a PRA, PRE uh, paper where they do basically this calculation in full, um, including the calculation of the entropy of the entropy term. So I'll ask her to circulate the PDF. Okay.